holiness of God, the holiness of God. It is without measure. Thank you, praise team. Brother David, before we dismiss, get my attention so I will not forget, or whoever's over the offering, make sure I don't forget to allow you to worship in tithing and offerings. You may be seated if you want to, if you're still praying, that's fine. The holiness of God. Remember I told you this morning that we're seeing more manifestations of God's presence since we've started bragging on him and talking about God than ever in the history of New Haven. Well, I think we found out a secret. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Amen. God is beginning to manifest in a supernatural ways. I love seeing the Lord move like this. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I also love the word. I was talking to Ben Fugit today on the phone. We were talking about what God was doing at the church. Not really have any idea what we were about to get into. We knew this morning was good, but didn't know about tonight yet. I told him, I said, there came a point where we went from about 70 people on average and just fell through the basement to in the 30s and all kind of folks left and and I got to the point I said God what in the world's going on I said I, I, I know you told us to start the church I know that you said you were going to use us to reach the city I just don't understand and I remember so clearly he said three words to your pastor he said preach my word and that word has never ever failed us amen through the good and the bad brother Ricky through the good and the bad, his word was true. Heaven and earth will pass away. But he said, my word shall never pass away. It's the word that has kept us. After the Holy Ghost shout was over and it seemed like the anointing had kind of subsided and the music died down and we went home and we didn't have our Holy Ghost fit like we love having in this building, the word still kept us. These young people who are coming to the Lord, just like last Sunday. Moves of the Lord were great. When they feel His presence in service, it's awesome. But the word they got in children's church and in Sunday school is what has kept them. So we're going to preach the word. Thank you for what you've done tonight in obedience to the Lord. There have been so many of you who have obeyed, and God's used you. And I'm excited. You know, sometimes you wonder when the Lord finally busts the doors open and things start happening fast. You wonder how you can stand it. But I'm glad he gives us the grace to continue fighting the good fight and hopefully carrying out our work. I told Ben today, I said, I, I, said, I kind of feel like I just want to go lay on my face. I said, sometimes I'm afraid I can't even preach because of the move of the Lord. But God's given me the grace and the help to pour into you tonight. Stretch your hand this way. Let's believe God to speak to us. Spirit of the living God, I need that anointing. That anointing that so many times has poured from this pulpit and we felt a shaking in our souls and knew that we had been in the presence of Almighty God. Anoint your vessel to preach your word and help me to adequately convey your holiness, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll see a throne set to your right on stage and it is a representation of the inhabitation of our Father, of our God. God is enthroned. He inhabits the praises of his people. And I can indeed say that in this building, we have seen God enthroned for quite some time. And I'm ready for him to keep it going. I don't want to see an end to this revival and this awakening. He is holy. Of all the words that could describe our God, Holy is at the top of the list. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, 15, For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I want you to repeat that phrase with me. Whose name is holy. He said, I live in a high and holy place, 
But also, with them. can I stop there just a second, Brother Ricky? i got to say this. The place where he's staying has to be holy because everywhere he touches, it permeates. Everywhere, that, if he sits on a throne, that throne's going to get holy. If he walks in New Haven Church of God, that church is going to move with the holiness of his presence. Amen. When God moves his spirit inside your sinful vessel and is washed with the blood of Jesus, your vessel becomes holy. Woo. It can't help but get holy when the Holy One enters your presence. <laughs> he said, I live in a high and holy place. But also, here's good news for us. With the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. What do you do, God? I come to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. If you are broken tonight or have been broken recently. Based on what God's spoken with interpretation of tongues lately, based on what he's telling you from his word now, he has come to lift up the meek. He has come to raise up the lowly. He has come to exalt you in due time. You thought you were anointed in the past, but get ready. The devil's shaking in his boots because he's afraid somebody just got a hold of revival. Somebody in the room tonight came up to the altar. Somebody was at your chair. Somebody got a hold of Jesus, and he is beginning an awakening in your life when that takes place there ain't no devil in uh, on earth or in hell that can hope to stop you mm -hmm. yeah he said in the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That means you can't come in here bragging, stuck up, thinking a lot about yourself. You got to come in here saying, God, if it weren't for you, I'd be dead. Lord God, if it wasn't for your holy, awesome, amazing grace, I'd be burning in hell tonight. But thank you that mercy showed up one more time when I should have busted the gates of hell wide open. And mercy said, come on, child. Mama's praying. Daddy's interceding. The church is praying under the anointing of the Holy Ghost cause of mercy and grace that we are here tonight. He said, I'll revive the hearts of the contrite, those who are broken. In the scripture, the word holy is defined as sacred, set apart, free from defilement of crimes, idolatry, and other unclean and profane things. Let me tell you how holy God is. He's so holy that when Moses met him at a burning bush on Mount Horeb, he said, son, I'll paraphrase, <laughs> he said, son, get your shoes off, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. A lot of times Brother Colton will be up here singing uh, on praise band, and you'll see him just slip those shoes off. It's because he's standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now because we are standing in his presence on holy ground. Oh, glory to God. Let me tell you how holy he is. Some of you already know this, but God was so holy that when he had Moses and the workers to build the most holy place, he said, make sure you put a thick veil there. And he said, one time a year, I'm going to let one person approach my holiness. He said, it can only be the high priest. That high priest has to go through a series of being sanctified, anointing, uh, uh, setting apart, making sure his clothes are just right, making sure that the anointing's been placed on his body. But here's what I love, and you know where I'm going. It also told us that he had to take coals that were from the brazen altar. He had to dip them things out and it couldn't just be any coals. It had to be coals that were in a location, in a zip code where the blood of the bull had dripped down upon them. And so once we see him walking into that holy place, he comes in and he begins pouring on the incense. That incense represented his presence. That incense represented the spirit of God. And when he poured the incense upon the coals, as you can imagine when you are grilling on your charcoal grill about to cook up some ribeyes and sirloin can I get an amen steam and smoke lifts up and sometimes it gets so big you have to close your eyes or you won't be able to see well the same thing took place when the high priest went into the most holy place as he pulled back the veil there was so much of a like a steam and smoke rising from the coals that had been touched by the blood of the bull that now he could enter the most holy place sprinkle the blood without being struck dead by the holiness of God. 1 Samuel 2, verse 2. Not sure these will be on your screen. I go a little nuts in this series, so sometimes you won't even have Scripture up there. 
Forgive me. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is no, none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Whoa, hallelujah. Mm, rock and rollers thought they had something. People who played heavy metal and rock thought they were the stuff. Ain't nobody got nothing on the rock of ages. Oh, hallelujah. Isaiah 6, verse 3. And, the, and one called to another. Who's he speaking of? He's speaking of the angels. And Isaiah, he said, one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Mm. Man, if they do that all around the clock... Mm, you talking about rocking around the clock tonight? <laughs> They're singing holy around the clock tonight to the rock of ages. Oh, hallelujah. So we begin looking, and we see that in the future, the word holy is going to be very important, Brother Ben Fugit. Because when I go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20, and the first part of 21, it says, this is speaking of the future, the millennial reign. That means when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, he will rule with a rod of iron. Mm, boy, I could go somewhere right there. Mm, can, I, can I have a little liberty? Is it okay to say I got ticked off today, this afternoon? I don't think that's a bad word. Most I got ticked off. Me and my family sitting down eating. Love that chicken from Popeye's. Said I love that chicken from Popeye's. I was eating that chicken. I was eating my biscuit. My wife said, hey, let's check this show out. I said, okay, but... It seemed like I saw something on there, and I won't even go into it right now, but it seemed like I saw something on there that didn't look right on the preview, but honey, let's go ahead and check it out. We're going to sit there and have us a good old time eating our chicken and biscuits and mashed potatoes and gravy and coleslaw and Cajun fries, sweet tea. Within three minutes, we're watching that. Our family's sitting there having a good old time, and they show a guy that holds a camera up, puts his arm around another guy on the corner of the street, and they kiss right there on TV. I said, turn that off about burn me up I'm looking forward to a day where Jesus comes back and he rules with a rod of iron and he don't let that mess get on the TV or the internet or the billboards I won't have to walk through the mall when Jesus rules and see a half naked woman from Victoria's Sir, uh, I, can't even, I don't know the name Victoria's Secret flashing almost everything she's got praise God when Jesus comes back it'll be holiness unto the Lord in that day, he said, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. Woo, my Lord, I just felt the Holy Ghost. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem. He ain't talking about marijuana. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine Sister Deborah pulling out a piece of Wrigley gum and it says, holiness unto the Lord. Can you imagine? You imagine. Now, you know I like Dr. Pepper. Imagine me pulling out one of them Dr. Peppers. Y'all like them commercials where that guy said he invented the college playoffs? I love that guy. You know I invented it? I'm going to pull out a Dr. Pepper if they've still got it in the millennial reign. You know what's going to be right beside Dr. Pepper? Holiness unto the Lord. My goodness, it's going to be amazing. You won't even be able to go through town without hearing about the holiness of Almighty God. He said even the pots in Jerusalem will have holiness to the Lord of hosts. You know, people can fashion other gods in their minds or with their hands, but no one can ever come close to matching the holiness of God if God will allow Next week, I'm going to talk about how God feels about the competition. <laughs> about the other idols, false god, other religions that ain't nothing but junk. But I'll save that for just another week. But I'm here to tell you something. When you start talking about the holiness of God, idols shiver if they could. Demons shake. When you speak about how holy God is, you have something, oh can I go there? You have something like this take place in the Philistine camp. They take the Ark of the Covenant and they, my, you know Sister Deborah where we're going now. They set the Ark of the Covenant right there in the temple of some old stupid idol called Dagon. Kids don't repeat stupid word. I know that's not a good word. But they put him in the house of an idol called Dagon. They wake up the next morning and uh oh Dagon is fallen on his face. Oops. Somebody must 
must have tipped him over. So they prop him back up, and then the next day, they uh, go about their business. They leave the ark of the Most High God right there in the presence of idolatry and abomination. And they let him sit there with all his glory in a house that was built for paganism and things that go against him and abomination. Oh, but the next day, they come back out there with their, their little short sleeves and ties that they had them. Maybe that's like Colton. They might have a little bow tie. And the, and the way they, they walk across, they notice, wait a minute, I can't step foot across the threshold because I see the head and the hands of my God broken and laying where that I wanted to go. What happened? That night after they propped him up, the glory of God shook that statue that was lifeless to begin with. And before God got done with it, it was in such a shape that no matter if they had every bit of super glue and gorilla glue in the world, nobody was going to put together what God broke apart. Oh, my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Woo, if you ain't used to this kind of power, then get your seatbelt on and make an appointment to be here every week. You'll enjoy it. Hallelujah. Holiness to the Lord. The holiness of God is illustrated perfectly as we make our journey back to Mount Calvary. We see that the holiness of God was evident. Why? Because as Jesus hung there on the cross, we understand that the holiness of God made demands. Holiness would not allow the Father to take a sabbatical, to get up in the, in, uh, maybe he'd got in his sports car and headed on down to the earth and popped out on Mount Calvary and said, Hey, Jesus, that's good. You did a good job. Cut. We're going to uh, just bring you back up to heaven and everything's going to be fine. You don't have to go any farther. No. The holiness of God demanded that Jesus would have to die for the sins of all the world. I say, man, that sounds pretty rough. But here's what I like about holiness. Holiness doesn't change his mind when it feels bad. Holiness doesn't turn direction just because things don't seem to be going the way that God likes. He knows that his holiness demands that he follows through when he puts a plan together. And so the holiness of God was evident at Mount Calvary. For we see that as Jesus hung there and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because holiness demanded that the Father forsake sin. The Bible tells us that Jesus became our sin. Look at your neighbor and said, You've got a lot of it. That didn't make you feel too good, did it? Some of you say, Well, I'm saved now. Well, praise God, but you still had some in your past. Jesus took your sin. Take your finger and point at yourself and said, My my sin. Mm. He took my sin. He took your sin. He took our sin upon himself. And because of his sacrifice, the holiness of God demanded that there must be payment for sin. And it was death. Death came and it took Jesus Christ into the heart of the earth. And we know that on the third day, praise God. Sister Laura, on the third day, he got up. On the third day. Mm, those linen cloths that had wrapped his fragile body that had been beaten and broken and was bloodied, that cloth just began falling to the, to the, uh, where he was laying on that, like a bench type structure. And it, it just fell down and as he rose up in a supernatural body. Jesus had to pay the price because the holiness of God demanded it. The absolute holiness of God is what sets God apart from every other being in the universe. It's about to get real, Neil. It's about to get real. Y'all stay with me. Although God is our Father, our Helper, and our Creator, His ultimate characteristic is His holiness. The Bible mentions the holiness of God more than it does the love of God. The holiness of God, get ready, is so strong that you could not approach it and Him in His full holiness without dying except the blood of Jesus covers you. He is so holy. Don't get cocky. Don't say, oh, I'm, full of, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I've spoken other tongues and given out interpretation. I've been flowed through with the gifts of healing and word of knowledge, word of revelation. I preach before thousands. I've sang before hundreds of thousands. Well, maybe you have. But don't get cocky because if you were to approach the absolute holiness of God, you would be struck dead except for the blood of Jesus that covered you. You're not good enough to approach His holiness. You're not, uh, you don't live right enough to approach His holiness. You would die if you approached Him in full holiness before the throne right now tonight if you were to make the trip except that God's grace and His blood covered you. That kind of changes things just a little bit, don't it? 
That makes me think of God a little differently than just, hey, you're my buddy. Hey, let's go hang out, Lord. Hey, uh, let's, let's go do something fun today and watch a game. And, and Lord, we're going to just goof off and tell a bunch of jokes. Uh, you know, I look at God as a friend, and he is a friend, but there's a, there's a, a limit to how you approach God in that manner. You, you don't get calloused. You don't just joke around and act like God's just your buddy. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. Psalm 24, 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? Because of our ability given to us through Jesus to boldly approach the throne. And we love that verse. Yet we've almost forgotten how holy he is. We thrive on grace, mercy, and favor while many times ignoring the fact that God is absolutely, above all, holy. Revelation 4 and 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, say it with me, church, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I know I'm getting on a little side path, but it's okay. God will give me a few seconds. I like the fact to know that he is the one who is and who is to come because that means every weapon that's formed against you and me, every trick of the devil, every obstacle, every bear trap that he throws in the middle of our path, God says, oh, don't worry about it. Child of God, I done been there. I know how to set the trap. I know how to defend you. I know how to stand up on your behalf, my God. I know how to be the strong tower that you can run into because of the name of the Lord. I know how to defend and guard you. Because I done been there. Oh, hallelujah. Who is and who is to come. He's done been into every situation you're going to face. And he knows how to beat it. Mm. The way that we approach church services must focus on his holiness more than his blessings. There are angels all day long who do nothing but worship him and speak of how holy he is. And yet sometimes, now get ready, there's a fine line with what I'm about to say between condemnation and conviction. Make sure you stay on the side of conviction, not condemnation, Pastor. You've got to be careful when you enter the house of the Most High God because, well, I was about to say if I'm mistaken, but I'm not. I know this is right. We come here for a purpose. We come here for an encounter with the Holy Ghost. We come here to meet together and to bind together and to rejoice and worship and to shout about the victory, see souls saved, delivered, set free, healed, baptized with the Holy Ghost. We come because we want an encounter with the Most High God. And yet how many times do we walk in the building and we're talking about everything besides Him? Isn't that easy to do? Let me get a little carnal, Neil. Say, get in the flesh, Pastor. This morning, I wanted so bad to come in here saying, roll tide. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to let it rip, India. Roll tide. We just blasted Georgia. But I come in this morning thinking, he is holy. Whether they won or lost, my God's holy. Yeah. You know what? When they lost to Ole Miss, what, two, about two weeks ago, he was still holy. And it did not affect, Brother Gary, my worship one bit. I enjoy watching sports, and some of you do too. But when we come into this place, whether your team wins or loses, here's something from your pastor that it might be good to think about. Leave that behind. Leave it in the parking lot. Leave it in the, the car or the house. Now, again, don't get under condemnation and say, Pastor won't let us talk about football. I am not saying that. And there's times I'll hang out with you and we'll have a good old time together. But there comes a point when we're moving into the awakening. Uh-oh. When we're getting into a place of just absolute Holy Ghost pandemonium moves that are so powerful that the prodigal's got to come back home move so strong that people who came in bound leave delivered there comes a point where somebody's got to be willing to sacrifice what you want to talk about and get into his presence and speak about what he wants you to talk about you see I, the reason that we're having such mighty moves of the spirit of God yes we've talked about him yes we've had good praise and worship but what's happening around here is some folks are meeting around 5 o'clock before Sunday night service some 
women are meeting, I think it's on Tuesdays. They're declaring the things of God. They're interceding for you, me, our families. Somebody's getting into the prayer closet and when there's not a group getting together and they just say, my Lord, I feel pulled to the holy place. I feel like God saying, get back to where you used to be. Get back to where I was your first love. Get back to when you knew me on a first name basis and call out my name because I'm sending awakening to Southside. I'm about to get into the schools and the city hall and into the suburbs and the houses, the rich and the poor. If my people who are called my, here I go, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Guess what he said he'd do? I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. He didn't say when you're hanging out talking about Alabama and Auburn. He didn't say when you're enjoying your best movie or you're talking about how much Pastor Michael loves Dr. Pepper and a pizza. He's talking about getting along with Jesus, getting back to the old time way of prayer, walking the old past, redigging the old wells, getting back to what Abraham does and say, my God, if it was good enough for Daddy, it's good enough for me. Now that's the real power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, help me. God's holiness is above every other thing when you're talking about Him. The angels cry, holy, holy, holy. I've had to fight in the spirit to make sure we didn't become some super spiritual freaks around here. Oh, I've... Help me, Lord. Lord said this. Lord said that. Lord, I'm thinking, man, does anybody ever else ever say anything to you? All you hear is the Lord. I mean, that'd be nice. But when I go back in the Bible, I find out that it was a long time between times God would speak a lot of times to people in the Old Testament. Does that mean he doesn't speak to us now? Of course not. He does. But a pastor has to wrestle in the spirit to make sure his church does not become a bunch of supernatural, super freaks. Super Christian freaks. That's what I was trying to say. Super Christian freaks. Everything's a devil. Everything's an angel. This is God. This is evil. Oh, you're in the spirit. You're not in the spirit. I'm led. You're led. You're not led. That's a bunch of garbage. You don't see the early church doing that. You don't see them. Oh, well, let's go ask Peter. Oh, I've had another vision from the Holy Ghost. Peter, do you think this is right? Uh, Peter has a dream one night. Well, I'm going to tell you what it was, Peter. This is it. Does God move that way? Yes, he does at times. But the problem is there, there is a, a place where a church is tempted to go that is not of God. And the Lord puts pastors and teachers and leaders over us to keep us in check, to make sure that every time we have a dream, it ain't the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, either is or not, to make sure that every time you got a pepperoni and sausage dream, that, that mama died in a car wreck, that it's not the Lord that's trying to show you that. It was your pizza and your subconscious mind. God puts leaders over us to make sure we don't go nuts with super spiritual stuff. On the other hand, God gives us balance to know and discern when something is of Him. And we've got so many people in this church who are able to discern that it is mind-blowing. There are people who flow in the gifts and it's always in balance and it's peaceful to my spirit. When you're, when you're flowing, I know it's God and you know it's God. So those are wonderful things that we have that balance. But when we talk about the holiness of God, it takes attention off of our gifts and our callings, and it puts everything back on Him. Everything. I don't care how anointed you are to sing. Sometimes you need to shut your mouth, sit on a pew, and not sing for about three weeks so that God can get you back to a place where He's in control. He's number one. He's the only one that gets the glory when you get on the stage. And then when you get humble, you can get back up there and sing. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm just giving you an example. Oh, Hallelujah. The holiness of God has to come back to the forefront of every church. Amen. He is holy. Let me tell you how holy he is. Mark 1, chapter, um, yeah, Mark chapter 1, verse 24, second part of that verse. A demon-possessed man. My goodness, sometimes the devils talk more about God's holiness than we do. A demon-possessed man said, let, let us alone. What have we to do with, with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
The reason that so many churches do not see the miraculous power of God is we have gone, we have left the recognition of His holiness. We've gotten into a super spiritual mode of everything's going to be flying high, Holy Ghost going to move, going to have ecstatic favor, you're going to be a millionaire, God's going to bless everything you put your hand to. Well, guess what? Some of the strongest Christians in the Bible went through the biggest mess that none of us have ever faced. Paul talked about being beaten, shipwrecked. There was times where the, uh, he was thrown in prison. He was put in chains. How many remember the story of Paul and Silas where his feet were even in the stocks? I don't know about you, but I don't think that would be comfortable. I probably wouldn't feel the chills of the Holy Ghost if somebody had my ankles in stocks and stretched me out in chains. I'd probably sit there and say, Dear Jesus, where's your delivering power? But yet they praised him and they sang unto him. God's holiness reminds us that we have not reached perfection. No amount of self-improvement can get you to a place where you're equal with His holiness. Until Jesus comes back and gives you a new body and makes you like, it says you'll become like Him, you will never even get close to the holiness of God. That's why we need His Holy Ghost within us. Reverend R.C. Sproul wrote a book, entitled The Holiness of God, and these are the words he spoke. The clearest sensation that a human being has when he experiences the holy, that's what he calls God, the holy, is an overpowering and overwhelming sense of creatureliness. That is, when we are in the presence of God, we are humbled and become most aware of ourselves as creatures. This is the opposite of Satan's original temptation. You shall be as gods when we get into the presence of almighty God we realize God we are not you God I don't even have the right to second guess your decision you know sometimes when we're kids we'll look at mom and daddy and we'll say they'll tell us to do something and we just we want to pop that inter where's Chloe she in here I was going to say the interrogative Statement or question, that's, that's what questions are. Isn't that right, Brandon? Interrogative. You just say yes. Inter interrogative. That means you're asking a question. Go tell your teacher, your pastor taught you that. Interrogative. That when we're asking the question, why? Now, sometimes parents have different responses to that. Some, some of them say, well, sweet little darling. Some of them say, don't you ask me again. Some of you say, I, because I said it, and I told you so. Yeah, isn't it funny how many times God tells us to do stuff and we say, why? I mean, you ought to be thrilled you're even hearing him talk to you. Why in the world would we pop off the interrogative question? Somebody's going crazy with that word tonight. Point at your pastor and say, it's you. I'm coming to a close. <laughs> Sometimes we ask God things, and I know that, that he um, entertains our questions and that he's gracious and he's loving just as a father would be. That there are times that he allows us to question him, but I want to encourage you to understand that he is so holy that when he tells you something, it is beyond questioning. There's no reason to say, God, am I really called? God, did you really tell me to work in that ministry? Did you really tell me to start that church in Southside? Oh, those are tempting questions. Did you really tell me I was supposed to be a part of that ministry? I was supposed to work with this pastor or this uh, youth pastor or whoever? Instead of just constantly questioning the holy God, why don't we start listening to the holy God and start doing what he says? St quit saying, well, I don't have the energy or I'm not smart enough or I don't have enough education. I'm not popular enough to be involved in that ministry. How about we quit throwing up excuses and we say, God, if you told me to do it, I'll do it. Amen? The holiness of God demands some things from us. Now, when I said I was coming to a close, that means I got about half a page left, Brother Randy. That don't mean 30 seconds. The holy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> The, <laughs> the holiness of God demands obedience. We just talked about that. Instead of asking him why, just do it. The holiness of God 
demands worship. He is so holy, you don't have to wait on the worship team to get you going. He's so holy, he was, he was holy enough when you were in the parking lot. Blessing your wife in the name of Jesus. Bless you, honey. Love you. You know, I'm being funny because that seems when the devil attacks us the most when we're on our way to church sometimes. He was holy enough when you were on the job or you were at home. I shared this morning, I didn't tell the name, but it was Jessica at uh, Martin's that led somebody to Jesus. Where are you at, Jessica? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for that <laughs> testimony. He was so holy that it meant more to her to share the gospel with somebody who was in need right then than to say, well, let's just wait till I get off and it might be a few hours. I don't really know how long it would have been, but it might be a few hours. By then, the convicting power might have been removed. It might not have been the moment two or three hours down the road. So she said, even if it risks me lose, oh, Lord Jesus, even if it is causing me to risk losing my job, I'll speak to them because, see, there's a difference. <laughs> Here we go, super spiritual again. There's a difference in somebody trying to witness to everybody that comes through Chick-fil-A or Jack's or Popeye's. Would you, you know Jesus? Some, some people need to close their mouth, take the money, Take the order, take the money, and do what you're supposed to do on the job. We actually, as good stewards, need to do everything as unto the Lord. That does not mean that you tell the boss, hey, boss, leave me alone. I'm a witness for the next three hours. I'm not going to do one thing. I'm not going to take anybody's order. I'm not going to clean the floor. I'm not going to empty the trash because I'm too spiritual. I've got, oh, if you're that spiritual, you're probably going to be fired and in the altar praying for another job. Amen? So there's a difference in divine moments and you constantly trying to make something happen. You probably will lose jobs if that's the case. So we've got, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, I, I heard a little, little comment up here on the front row. <laughs> Glory to God. There's a difference in being super spiritual and moving in divine moments. See, when you follow and understand the holiness of God, then you are sensitive to divine moments. You know when it's him moving or when it's your flesh moving. And when it's him moving, you're going to see some things happening. You might not always see an instant result, but there will be a seed planted, and it will bring forth a harvest. Can I get an amen, Sister Deanna? It'll bring forth a harvest. <laughs> the holiness of God demands a sacrificial lifestyle. Don't tell me that, preacher. I'll pay my tithes. I'll throw money in the offering. I'll support you. But don't tell me I'm going to have to sacrifice. You mean you're going to have to sacrifice time? You're going to have to sacrifice desires of the flesh. Uh-oh, you better give me a chord. You got to sacrifice desires of the flesh. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. What in the world are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about things that your flesh wants to do, drives you half crazy. You know it ain't right. God told you it wasn't right. Devil says, oh, it's okay. And your flesh wants it so bad, but God says, if you're going to absolutely recognize my holiness, there will be things you've got to sacrifice. And some of them even feel good. But if they go against the holy word, then you've got to stop. You've got to cut it off. You've got to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I make a decision today, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you're going to go the rest of your life. In the name of Jesus, I am going to say no to these desires of the flesh. Flesh, some of you need to look at your hand. <laughs> now, boy, I'd get carried off to the nut house if some people saw this. Some of you need to look at your flesh just because it's the only thing's going to get through to you and say, mm -hmm. you don't own me anymore. You don't have control over me anymore. Ben don't know I'm getting serious right now. There's nothing you can say, flesh. There's nothing you can do. There's no pull that you can put on me. There's nothing you can crave. My Lord, here he comes. There's nothing that you can tell me that will convince me that you've got more to offer me, me than my Jesus because I done been there. I done done that. I've experienced, and it wasn't nothing like what I felt when the Holy Ghost moved on me. I tried you, and you failed me. I went down your path, and you led me astray. I was well, and when I went down your road, I got sick. I didn't feel like I used to. 
because I thought I could trust you flesh. But my God said to tell somebody that when you crucify the flesh, the spirit will rise up in you and will give you power to overcome every temptation that comes your way. It'll lead you astray every time. But if you can choose the spirit over the flesh, God will give you overcoming power. Can I get an amen? amen? The holiness of God demands a rejection of sin itself. To say no, not just to flesh, which torments us and pulls us, but to say no to sin. To say no to things that are being legalized that you know ain't right. To say no to things that are being accepted by the majority, maybe in our nation, but you know it goes against God's word. To say no to sin. Luke chapter 1, verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Let me tell you what happens in you when you recognize the holiness of God. You start realizing who you're carrying. Wait a minute. The Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. See, when I thought he was my buddy, there was still some stuff I'd do and get away with and thought, oh, he'll just laugh with me. It ain't that bad. I ain't out killing people. I'm not out doing some horrible sin. Maybe I'm just watching something and it's just not right. And It, it, it probably is a little bit offensive. No, it's not a little bit offensive if you're absolutely holy. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the God that lives in you. You see, once you start re recognizing the holiness of God, here's where it gets real quiet, so I might as well sit down. <laughs> when you recognize the holiness... Uh-oh. Pull my sock up. When you recognize the holiness of God... That wouldn't have passed with old-time holiness. You won't show the leg. When you recognize old-time holiness... You start realizing the things that you say and do and watch and the people you're around and the things you even think actually matter. See, it's one thing to sit down with your buddy and get on the internet and look at some stuff. Well, it ain't quite pornography. She's still got on a bikini. Man, I didn't know you preached like this, Pastor. You're getting out there. It ain't that bad. Uh, they only said 37 words in that movie. I'm going to go ahead and go watch it. Uh-oh, is that condemnation or conviction? I'm going to let the Holy Ghost tell you. Because here's the thing. The closer you get to God, you're going to start seeing some stuff different than you see right now. We're not a condemning church. We're not here to say everything's a sin, everything's of the devil. No way. We'd be half nuts if, that, if we thought everything was a sin. There's a lot of freedom when it comes to serving the Lord. A lot. But there are some things that God's moving us away from and toward because he's starting to show us just how holy he is. And if we're going to actually take that scripture for what it says, we are the temple, the house, the home, the structure that houses of the Holy Ghost. That might make us change some of our behavior. Now, we know in the past they tried to legislate different things as being holiness. And it didn't work too well. Everybody was like robots, doing certain ways, addressing certain ways, acting certain ways with great intentions. But it wasn't always biblical. And that's why we try to be careful here at New Haven not to legislate what holiness is. But this is the fact of the matter. If it goes against the Bible, it's wrong. If it's offensive to the Holy Ghost, it needs to be offensive to you. Mm. <laughs> Lord's helping us. Aren't you glad you don't have a pastor beating you over the head about every stinking little thing? And, oh, it's a sin, it's a sin, it's a sin. That's not my job. My job is to lead you to his holiness. It's to lead you to want to be more like him. Not to condemn you over what you accept or allow because that's between you and God. God's going to help you. Amen. But if you'll, if you'll get with me on this journey, if you'll load up on this bus, Come on. Yes. if you'll go on this trip with me Come on. and make a decision that, Pastor, 
I realize we're not always going to be in the same seat. Some of us going to be a little closer to the front. Some, some of them's going to be hanging out in the back, and they won't ever get off the back seat, but thank God they'll make it to glory. Yes. You know, you always had them kids in the back smoking or <laughs> getting away with stuff on the back, putting a gum up under the seat, little hoodlums. <laughs> hey, some little hoodlums in the church. And by the grace of God, they're going to make it. <laughs> Bubble gum under the seat, but they still going to make it. <laughs> Somebody say praise the Lord. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Bubble gum and all. I ain't never heard preaching like this, have you? If you'll get on this bus with me, if you'll say, Pastor, I won't always see eye to eye with you, I know that. We're, we're going to have different convictions about stuff, I know that. But if I can get somebody to lock arms with me, somebody that'll lock arms and they'll say, though we differ on theology at times, we will agree on this, that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. And we're going to allow the Spirit of God to direct us and as we open the scriptures, he's going to reveal things to us we've never seen before. And we will follow the Lord in holiness. Stand with me, church. Holiness. Holy. 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 Lord God Almighty. Who was, who is, and who is to come. We serve a holy God. I'm so glad he doesn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. I'm glad of that. But I sure am thankful when he sees that we're at a level of maturity as a church to hear solid word like tonight and to digest it and say, God, I realize there's still stuff in my life that's offensive to you, but I'm going to work on it. You're going to help me. And we're going to get more in shape and in line with what you are asking of us. The awakening has begun. We used to say it's coming. That's, that time's passed. It's begun. And we got to get in shape. I remember telling my leaders about a year and a half ago. Well, it would have been about a year ago, actually. I looked them in the eye and I said this. I said, if there's anything in your life not right, you better get it right now. I said, because something's about to happen so big through this ministry and in this city that you will miss it if you don't get where you need to be with God. Some followed and some fell. But God's word came to pass. Bow your head with me. Oh God. Oh God, we love you. Lord, you have honored us as we've honored you. God, you've done amazing things in our presence. God, the church is growing and we're doing what you've asked of us. But I realize there's always going to be much more. I pray that you guard the hearts and minds of every person under the sound of my voice. That, Lord, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. I pray, oh God, that you would guard their minds and that you would station strong angels over us and over our babies and over our children. God, thank you that awakening has begun. And this nation is about to see a major revival. And Lord, if you will allow, let us be a part. Let us reach the nations for you. God, right now, I pray, is open up these altars one last time. Lord, you'll begin speaking to people on your own. You won't even need a preacher or anybody else coming up and whispering in their ear, Lord, that you're about to talk to some people. And as they approach... Pray, God, that you meet us. When you says, we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh to us. Now, Spirit of the Lord, have your will and have your way. Bring about great harvest through this ministry, we ask, in every life here. Please pray for just a moment. Please pray, church, just a moment. Oh, Lord, help me to be sensitive. If you're here, and you're trying to do right. You're trying to change. But you've not made that ultimate decision. 
there's a difference. You, you, when you're trying to do right and you're saying prayers over so often, there's a difference in that and total commitment. And total just laying down your life for Jesus. I feel a call right now for somebody in the room to surrender every part of their life to Jesus Christ tonight. You're about to experience something that perhaps you've never quite felt since you've been born. You might have even confessed sin in the past. You may have been saved in the past. And Throw theology out right now. Don't worry about who's right or who's wrong. If you're feeling the Spirit of God call you, don't worry about if you're still saved or not. You need to get to a place and confess that sin and let God wipe it away. If you feel the Lord calling you, it's not a person. It's the Spirit of God. If you want to come up and publicly acknowledge Jesus as Savior, then please make your way up here. We're only going to give you just a short time because the Lord will quickly move in a different direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to pray for this wonderful man. Anyone else wanting to come up and pray? I'm about to put this mic down. If you need to recommit your heart and life to God, I want you to come up tonight. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead, man.